Um, thanks very much for coming along and thanks very much for all, um, to Audrey and uh, the Campbell Collaboration for inviting me to uh, give a, a seminar, a webinar presentation to, do, to you today. Um, I'm very honoured to be here and um, I hope you find it interesting. Um, my name is Neil Hadaway. I'm a senior research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute in uh, Sweden and a senior researcher at the Mkata Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change uh, in Germany and a research associate at the Africa Centre for Evidence in South Africa. Um, I'm going to talk to you today uh, about, broadly speaking, technology to support more transparent, efficient and accessible evidence synthesis at scale. Um, just to uh, start off by saying uh, my thanks and um, declaring my, my interests, um, I am currently funded by Vinova, the Swedish technology funder, and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Uh, I'm also a co-chair of the Climate Solutions Coordinating Group of Campbell. Uh, I'm the center lead for uh, the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence Center in Sweden. And I'm also on the board of trustees for the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence. And I'm the co-founder and um, organizer of the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon um, events. Um, and I just want to say thank you to my uh, collaborator, Martin Westgate, um, from the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon as well. I'm presenting some of this work on his behalf. So what will I talk to you about today? Um, well, I wanted to basically give an overview of evidence synthesis technology. I'm going to start off by giving, um, by spending some time talking about the evidence synthesis methodology landscape. So where we are in terms of evidence synthesis, uh, some of the problems that we face as systematic reviewers and how uh, evidence synthesis technology, ES Tech, can um, help to overcome some of those challenges. I'll also talk about how the landscape for evidence synthesis technology looks, some of the challenges that we face in developing um, ES tech and what the path forward might look like in terms of trying to overcome some of these challenges and I'll end uh, on hopefully a happy note um, talking about what I see as a potential utopian future for evidence synthesis embracing technology. What I'm not going to talk to you about is how to automate a systematic review. So apologies to those of you who might have thought that you would get the, um, the secrets to being able to push a button and get a systematic review to be automated. I'm not going to focus on automation and hopefully by the end you'll realize why. I'm going to help try to convince you um, why uh, purely focusing on automation um, of systematic reviews um, isn't as, as useful when we're thinking about evidence synthesis tech technology, I'm going to be introducing the concept of evidence synthesis technology more broadly, and I'll hopefully try to convince you why that's useful. Um, I also won't be covering in too much detail um, some of the state of the art um, in automation um, or machine learning in particular with systematic reviews. If you're interested in um, technology and uh, in particular uh, automated support for systematic reviews, I'd really recommend checking out the slides from um, this Cochrane automation workshop um, that was hosted by the University of Southampton. Um, and I also have a link to the presentations that have got these active links in that I will um, upload in the uh, chat um, straight after. I can't do that at the same time. I can't multitask, I'm afraid. So just to start off, um, I wanted to introduce what we all know, that there are uh, rigorous gold standards for systematic reviews, evidence and gap maps, and the related systematic maps. We know there are organizations and communities of practice that help to support these rigorous gold standards that people are trying to achieve with systematic reviews. But we also know that uh, there are a large um, diversity of different uh, levels of rigor in systematic reviews and evidence syntheses that are published in the literature. We often see um, very poor quality evidence syntheses. Um, this uh, screenshot is from a project that's being run by the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence uh, called CEDA. It's the CEE database of evidence reviews and it has um, 
I think over a thousand now evidence reviews in the uh, subject of environment and environmental management and ecology. Um, and for each line in this schematic that you can see here, it's a review that has been critically appraised using a standardized peer reviewed uh, critical appraisal tool for evidence reviews. So you can see that there's um, from the red warning signs, there are uh, a, an array of different methods across the process of doing a systematic review that are being used, um, often not gold standard methodology. So we know that there are gold standard methods available, but we also know that they're often not being used. We also know that good quality systematic reviews require a humongous effort. Um, and this screenshot is from a paper that Martin Westgate and I um, published in Conservation Biology in 2019, where for environmental systematic reviews, we estimated the time requirements um, needed to complete a systematic review and a systematic map. So for a systematic review, we um, estimated 164 full-time um, person days, and you can see how that's distributed over the different stages of the project. And you can follow that link for the paper, um, and we've produced an app as well. But this is just to show that there's a huge amount of effort, that um, a huge amount of effort goes into developing search strategies, screening tens of thousands of search um, results, retrieving hundreds of full text, and then extracting data and critically appraising hundreds of articles. That's a huge amount of effort that is uh, done manually um, in the vast majority of cases. And that effort is not shared across reviewers. Typically, it's done manually, it's kept um, on people's hard drives, and it's not shared. On top of that, we face problems as systematic reviewers, even when we try to do gold standard systematic reviews, we're all probably familiar with this concept of evidence explosion or evidence uh, avalanche, that this kind of graph shows um, an almost exponential increase in the amount of published literature over time. So as systematic reviewers, we're facing more and more evidence for a given topic. And that's the case uh, for primary studies as well. So the studies that we try to include in our reviews, but also for systematic reviews, things that call themselves systematic reviews at least, are increasing exponentially. And this is actually what this graph shows. We also know because uh, there are um, uh, an increase in the number of poor quality or limited or biased systematic reviews or evidence syntheses, that there's a general lack of awareness of what's needed in a systematic review to be able to um, put faith in its findings. Um, and we know that there's limited capacity for undertaking systematic reviews, that people might know what a systematic review is roughly, but they might not be able to conduct it to a rigorous standard. And we also know that systematic reviews generate a huge amount of, of data. Uh, and it's easy to unintentionally make and then disguise errors in our data in systematic reviews. For example, when we move from one piece of software like Excel to, uh, like EndNote to Excel, that uh, transformation is often not particularly transparent, not particularly easy. There might be some coercing of data. We might lose some. We also know that um, a lot of people use spreadsheets for systematic reviews and spreadsheets are incredibly error prone. It's very easy to corrupt um, or accidentally delete large portions of data and to do so systematically in a way that is not very obvious. If you delete one cell, everything shifts up. That might not become, um, you might not become aware of that until later on um, and it might be too late. Um, it's also the case that a lot of useful information is stripped out during the review process if we go from one tool to another. So that useful, uh, very rich information that we have in bibliographic data, um, like DOIs, other identifying information, um, is often lost when we move to uh, a database that's then used for meta-analysis, for example. We also know um, from all of the research around Prisma that reporting in systematic reviews is often very poor as well. And that's where data are reported. They're often not reported in an easily um, usable way. So they're often not digitized or computable. Um, and where they are digitized, they're, they're often not computable, not um, provided in a structured format that's easily usable. And that means that verifying what people have done is often very challenging. 
And then finally, one of the, another problem is that there's increasing pressure on us as a community of practice and uh, methodologists to translate rigorous methods into scale. And by that, I mean people want more reviews. People want more people to be doing reviews. They want more reviewers. More people want to be uh, systematic reviewers. There's also increasing demands for improving the uh, efficiency of review processes to get a systematic review conducted to a rigorous standard in a shorter period of time. Often those pressures um, cause people to cut corners uh, in order to meet, uh, meet an evidence need. And then there's also pressure to make it easier for people to conduct reviews. Um, by, uh, and by that I mean people uh, increasingly asking to be able to learn the techniques needed for systematic reviews in a more digestible and um, more accessible way. That upskilling is um, a word I hate to use, but it, people are asking for easier upskilling. So where does evidence synthesis technology come in? Well, we in the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon define it as tools and frameworks to support accessible, transparent, efficient, uh, efficient and rigorous evidence synthesis methods. Um, these tools and frameworks will sit on a spectrum from the not so technically complicated to the very technically complicated, from uh, perhaps a database tool that's very basic that just helps you to structure your data, all the way up to machine learning tools that take some of the manual processes away from people, perhaps. And that spectrum is an important, um, diverse uh, set of different tools to, to bear in mind. Some of the types of tools that I wanted to um, just briefly mention are things like review management tools. So tools that hold your hand and help you to document the process and everything that uh, a review involves throughout the, the steps of a review. They might be tools that help you to generate search strings or to translate search strings. They might be machine learning document classifiers, um, either for include or exclude decisions or uh, classifying studies based on their predicted content. They might be packages to support meta-analysis. They could be online reporting checklist forms to hold your hand as you go through a reporting checklist. And they might be user interfaces for software or for learning resources to uh, improve education around systematic reviews. This is the kind of thing that we're thinking about when we uh, envisage evidence synthesis technology. And I'm going to try to convince you uh, why a broad definition of evidence synthesis technology um, such as this is an important one. But I want to start off just by um, providing some tools that will act as a point of departure if you are interested in using technology in a review. Uh, perhaps the most familiar one is the Systematic Review Toolbox. Uh, this is a, a website that's created by Chris Marshall. Um, and it's a database of tools that can be used for evidence synthesis um, technology, particular, um, in particular systematic reviews. Um, as of yesterday, there were 235 tools in the toolbox, um, and that number is increasing rapidly. There's also, I've introduced before, the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon, which is something that I've organized with Martin Westgate. It's a series of events and uh, online projects, um, but in its main part is a collaborative community that produces and validates and tests evidence synthesis technology. Um, and the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon has been involved with the production of 22 tools and eight papers that introduce frameworks and theory around evidence synthesis technology. Um, they also um, run, we also run the Evidence Synthesis and Meta-Analysis in R conference, which had its inaugural conference in January um, and so far had over 1,600 people um, watching the conference materials. And then another um, key organization is the Inter International Collaboration for the Automation of Systematic Reviews. And that's a network of researchers working with evidence synthesis technology. So these are the, um, perhaps some of the more um, key organizations and groups. And what are the, some of the tools that we're talking about in evidence synthesis technology? I just wanted to briefly introduce some of them from the, uh, the hackathon. Evi Atlas is a tool that uh, takes a database of studies with geographical locations and turns that database into an interactive uh, cartographic map, a uh, geographical information system. The Gray Literature Reporter is an ongoing project that aims to transparently document web-based gray literature searching. 
Metaphor Reports is an extension to the package Metaphor used in meta-analysis that aims to produce automated uh, methods and results text based on a model input to make sure that everything is reported and everything is reported consistently. Prisma 2020 uh, is a uh, web-based tool in our package to support people um, building standardized um, review flow diagrams compliant with the Prisma 2020 checklist. RobVis uh, is a tool that is um, produced to help people visualize risk of bias assessments. Um, DOI to text aims to take a, a digital object identifier and find uh, the full text and classify it into different sections of text for text analysis. Metadat is a database of meta-analysis data used for training and validation purposes. Citation Chaser is a tool for um, uh, forwards and backwards citation chasing as a supplementary searching method. So that gives you an indication of the kind of um, purposes and objectives for, um, for evidence synthesis technology. We also have these uh, systematic review management tools. So uh, anyone who's conducted a systematic review has probably um, come across a tool that helps to uh, store their search results, to remove duplicates, to screen abstracts, titles, abstracts, and full texts, to hold those full texts, and then be a resource for documenting uh, extracted data. Um, there are dozens of these review management tools, so many, in fact, that there are now systematic reviews of systematic review management tools. Uh, and that number is increasing. Um, there's a huge uh, diversity of different tools that aim to cover different aspects of the review process, or they all aim to to cover the whole spectrum of review steps and hold your hand along the way, but they have different strengths and weaknesses at different points. Um, and some of them are very powerful, some of them are very basic. Um, but if you're interested, these, these resources um, are a static snapshot of um, at least up until last year, some of the tools that were available. Some of these reviews though, they um, not only go out of date quite quickly because new tools are um, produced, but they also uh, focused often on one discipline. Um, so it's, it's rare to find a systematic review of systematic review tools that has everything and is up to date. I don't think that really exists. But it highlights a problem that that information is quite difficult to um, identify and we'll cover that um, in a little while. Interestingly, at the same time, um, as we try to do more and more with formal rigorous evidence synthesis in terms of using technology, there's a convergence or a co-evolution with some other disciplines um, where things like scientometrics or bibliometrics and literature mapping um, are starting to converge on what we're trying to do with systematic reviews. So often with a systematic review that we want to apply technology to, we might want to look at a larger evidence base or um, try to use tools like topic modeling or text analysis to reduce the human effort. And in doing so, we're kind of converging on uh, the methods used in these other disciplines, like topic modeling and literature mapping. Um, the, the difference is from the history of systematic reviews, we're coming from the perspective of trying to maximize rigor, comprehensiveness, uh, minimize bias, and from the fields of um, information science and data science, where there's scientometrics and bibliometrics, they're often trying to um, map very large evidence bases, uh, but they're not coming from the process of rigor. So they're very powerful, but not as rigorous. Um, but I think there's a, a real need to, um, to link up more with these disciplines as we move forward with evidence synthesis technology. Um, because as well, these methods um, like bibliometrics and um, literature mapping um, are often, um, they're not content-based, and by not being content-based, I mean they're based often on abstracts and not full text. So there's that rigorous manual step of extracting data from full text that is missing. But moving back to um, evidence synthesis technology, applying technology in the context of systematic reviews, rigorous systematic reviews, faces a number of key challenges. One is that for the average systematic reviewer, there's generally a lack of awareness of what's possible using technology. People don't really know what tools are available, what they can do already with existing tools and what they could do if they were able to adapt tools. 
Um, there's also caution over adoption and use. So people are generally a little bit cautious about using some of the more powerful um, uh, ES tech like machine learning classifiers. There's also a confusing array of options for users who do know where to look. Those 235 tools in the systematic review toolbox um, often overlap uh, and are duplicated. So it's difficult to know which one to choose. There's a steep learning curve often, um, and there's an investment in trying to apply a tool to your review um, that could have a cost. Um, and also, um, even systematic review toolbox, although it's trying to keep up to date, um, it's very difficult to produce an up-to-date decision support system um, to support people in choosing which tools they should use in their systematic review. That would require a huge amount of effort. And uh, the systematic review toolbox uh, team are, um, I believe, entirely voluntary. Um, so it, it's always going to be incredibly difficult to produce a really robust tool. Um, but users face a lot of challenges when they're trying to, um, trying to find a tool that they can use. In addition, there is often an emphasis, possibly even an overemphasis, on uh, full automation of systematic reviews. Um, and where there is uh, a lot of promise in uh, tool automation, particularly when it comes to critical appraisal and data extraction, that's often discipline specific um, in the, the provision of tools that can be applied across disciplines in ways that can extract data or critically appraise data reliably. Um, it's very difficult to find that, that um, there often isn't any validation in multiple disciplines and the tools are often quite specific to particular research designs or um, terminological contexts like health, for example, that might not work um, particularly well at all if translated to agriculture. Um, in addition, there's also a lack of interoperability between tools, so it's often very difficult to move from one tool to another if you want to put your tools in a pipeline. Um, people already know this if they're trying to extract their search results from a bibliographic database, put them into one tool for deduplication, put them into another tool for data extraction. That process of moving between them is quite difficult and it's easy for data to be corrupted or, or lost. Um, and on top of that, there um, is a lot of redundancy. There are a lot of tools that do the same job or do overlapping jobs. Um, that's at best confusing for users, but it also indicates um, a lack of collaboration um, or an opportunity for more collaboration. Um, rather than putting effort into two tools um, that can't be supported so well because the work is being done voluntarily, perhaps, it might be better to put that collective effort into one tool that could be supported um, and produced in a much better way. In addition, there's a lot of uh, tools. There are a lot of tools that become extinct, meaning that people put effort into producing them, but are unable to maintain them. That might be that the underlying system that they work through has a change that causes the tool itself to not work. It might be uh, that uh, the data going in is provided in a different format and that tool no longer works. It might be that the server, um, if it's web-based, that the tool is provided through uh, is no longer available. So uh, it doesn't take long on the systematic review toolbox, for example, to find uh, a tool where the link is broken or the tool is no longer available. In addition, tools that are available um, and work well are often expensive. Um, or on the other hand, um, they, the level of support that's available if something goes wrong, if the tool is produced voluntarily, um, is often poor. Um, and that's a large, uh, largely a result of the fact that there's no real funding for concerted evidence synthesis technology efforts. Everybody producing this either has to do it as part of a short-term grant or they need to be charging fees for use. So then what are some of the solutions to these challenges? What do we have as a path forward? Well, I've already introduced a couple of communities of practice, but I think community of, communities of practice are really key here. Um, I've already talked about the evidence in hackathon and the international collaboration for the automation of systematic reviews. Um, but despite these organizations, there are still um, a large number of tools that are produced that overlap, they're redundant, 
and they're produced in isolation, meaning that someone will produce a tool that's already that niche has already been filled. And people may be totally unaware that that niche has been filled or that it's even um, a sort of acknowledged uh, gap for a tool. Um, and then they may find it quite difficult to uh, publicize that tool, market it, and make people aware of it. So the, the use of that tool then um, is a problem. And communities of practice would help to, um, to get over this problem by making people more aware that those tools already exist. They also would help to uh, improve collaboration and avoid waste and tool extinction. Um, and so by being uh, by working collaboratively on a project, the chances that um, someone won't be around to help support or extend or um, fix bugs in a project is lower. And we also need to be better at um, identifying funding for collaborative uh, free to use tools. And it's the free to use issue that um, I think is really important for people working in resource constrained contexts where paying for tools would be a large part of a budget, particularly as we move forward to becoming more efficient in the review process. Another issue is that the production of tools um, really needs to be more needs based. We need to be better aware of what's needed by users, by systematic review authors. Um, and that includes trying to identify um, things, processes in the systematic review pathway that still can't be done particularly efficiently or uh, transparently. So um, thinking about uh, which tools might really help to drastically uh, increase transparency and or drastically increase efficiency. Um, I think it's also really important to think about accessibility in formats or interfaces. So most of the review management tools that are available now are web-based, they're cloud-based. Um, and if you work in a resource constrained context, particularly in low and middle income countries, it's very difficult to use a web based review management tool if your internet cuts out or if you only have um, electricity for a certain part of the day. Also, downloading large PDFs uh, is particularly challenging um, if you're having to do it one by one and it takes a few minutes for each PDF. So I think. Um, thinking carefully about who the users are and what their constraints are is really important. Um, it's also really important to think about making sure that the tools that we produce are as usable as possible, meaning that they need to fit into current practices and traditions. Trying to have uh, transformational change in the way that people do reviews, um, whilst also using a new piece of software that requires a, um, a learning curve is going to be more of a barrier than if we can find something that fits very easily into an existing practice. For example, a Chrome add-on is perhaps easier to use than downloading another piece of software. And often those, um, those, that thinking around um, fitting into existing practices isn't particularly well thought out. We don't often know exactly how people are doing systematic reviews. Um, so I think there's a great need to think more about the, the end users there. Um, and then I think there's also a need to have an appropriate level of what's called functional separation. So um, as I've mentioned already, there are more than 30 review management tools and they all aim to cover the entire review process, but many of them are very specific. Many of them are quite inflexible um, and moving between one tool and another is not particularly easy and often involves stripping out of rich information when that happens. So, what I think we really need to uh, provide users with is an array of options that allow them to um, move between different tools for different parts of the process. This is one of the Vienna principles of the um, International Collaboration for the Association of, um, for the Automation of Systematic Reviews. Um, that by having a large number of tools that do a small thing very well um, with easy interoperability, you allow someone to um, overcome small challenges and to choose a, a tool that fits their context in the be uh, best way. And then that relates to the, the, uh, the next point on um, interoperability, that we want users to be able to, to use tools seamlessly to move from one to another without um, having problems when they, they move between them. 
and they should be able to exit and enter any tool at any point uh, with the same level of data. And I'll talk a bit about how this might be possible at the end. And then I think there's a real benefit to open source collaboratively produced tools. Many of us who produce open source tools know that there's a cost involved with making things meaningfully open source, meaning that the code is understandable and usable by anyone. But by being able to produce tools that are open source, it means that we can do more together. It means that by working collaboratively, we're more likely to produce tools that are generalizable and discipline agnostic, rather than having to produce different tools uh, for specific contexts. For example, one in uh, clinical health, one in agriculture. It's also important to work collaborative, collaboratively to make sure we have those diverse voices. Um, for example, people saying that actually I can't use cloud-based software because I have a problem with my internet. And it also helps to mitigate extinction risk by um, ensuring that the work that's been done to produce a tool is publicly available and can be reused can be updated, can be taken over and uh, that um, tool taken forwards by someone else. And as someone who curates an open source um, set of projects, I know that's very difficult and it's a challenge that has um, associated costs, but I think um, we can get better as tool producers in being more um, well-practiced in open science, uh, open source practices. And then another issue is that um, the, the way that tools are produced and validated is currently um, not really fit for purpose. There's uh, a lack of consensus on what a validated tool looks like, what that validation step might be. And I think there's a difference between internal validation of a tool, does it work as the original uh, developer intended, and external validation, does it work elsewhere? Um, often we um, see internal validation and assume that it can be used in another context. And then when it doesn't quite work as planned in another context, the tool is then assumed to have failed. Or um, alternatively, it might be seen that it works in its own context and then assumed that it works in other contexts without really testing. And there's differences in what that validation might look like. So it might be entirely appropriate for the producers of a tool to validate internally whether it works as they intended in their own context. But then external validation would really benefit from a level of independence and standardized criteria for validation using existing uh, data sets for validation that then make it easier to compare different tools and to see how things, um, how things perform in different contexts. So that's another area of work. And so uh, I just wanted to sort of uh, finish up by thinking about a utopian future. And if we imagine a process for a review team going from start to finish in their review, I think it would be nice to envisage a future where review authors are able to connect with a community of practice around systematic reviews, but also around uh, technology and that systematic reviewers are aware of technology that can be used and can sort of provide feedback to people wanting to use that in a project. The, the reviewers would be able to identify appropriate methods and tools that fit their own context and constraints and uh, discipline and settings and can apply them. That there's easy facilitation of education and training to ensure that people have the skills needed to use the tools and the methods thinking more broadly about systematic reviews. That it is easy for people to check whether there is existing work on the same subject, whether that's um, yeah, mainly thinking about existing systematic reviews and that they can have support in planning and developing their protocol um, using technology. That they would then be able to share data with and from overlapping reviews so they can take some of the work that's been used in a, a existing reviews, saving themselves effort, and then they can share that. That they can conduct their review using technology that many of us are aware of for searching for screening in particular, that's where machine learning um, would come in, for extracting data, critically appraising the studies, and synthesizing and producing visualizations. They can then seamlessly update their review, and if they're producing a living review, that can be maintained. And that at the end of their review, they publish clearly and report clearly computable review data. Um, so this is what a review might look like for me. 
And what do I mean by computable review data? Well, that would be data from a review that is provided in a way that allows easy verification of what was done in a review, that it allows someone to come along and replicate parts or um, the whole of a review easily. It allows people to reuse data from a review for another purpose. That purpose, for example, might be an overview of reviews if you're combining multiple reviews together. You would also then be able to do research on research to, for example, understand how people are using methods in systematic reviews, which databases people are using, what they are finding and what methods they're using. And to validate tools using existing systematic review data as example data sets to compare different methods. And uh, I think this also highlights for me the need to be able to link that really rich data that we're mining as systematic viewers from bibliographic databases. Um, for example, records with digi digital object identifiers that go into a pipeline of a systematic review have a lot of efforts, decisions, um, processes, data is extracted, um, curated, and then synthesized. And that information can still be held on, at the record level, at the bibliographic record level, and then associated back with a digital object identifier that can be shared with other people. And where there's overlap or a need for reuse or verification, those linkages are maintained throughout the review process. And that level of technology is really important for me as well. If you're interested in that in particular, there's an ongoing project on uh, designing um, designing data that's uh, computable in systematic reviews. And then more broadly, um, there are a couple of links to papers on uh, thinking about utopian futures for systematic reviews, in particular, how technology can uh, help us to plan for that future. So hopefully um, I've convinced you there. I've talked a bit about um, the fact that rigorous evidence synthesis is increasingly costly and that evidence synthesis technology can provide a suite of solutions, not only about automation, but also um, about improving people's awareness, building capacity for reviews, helping to increase efficiency, helping to increase scalability, and also transparency, and that there's a, a role for evidence synth synthesis technology across all of those. Um, I've also tried to highlight that the evidence synthesis technology landscape uh, is improving rapidly, but um, right now, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to make sure that it's efficient and collaborative. And some of those futures, uh, some of those things we need in the future are uh, needs-based tool development, more collaboration and less waste, um, and attention to resource limited contexts, the expansion of evidence synthesis technology beyond automation, uh, and following on from that, a holistic approach to evidence synthesis technology um, that will help to pull all of these threads together. And in particular, dedicated leadership and funding um, to help uh, oversee all of these tasks. So thanks very much for your time. Um, I've provided some links here and um, right now I will put a link to this um, presentation in the chat. Um, if you have any uh, questions, please do pop them in the chat um, and I'll read them out. Uh, I think I also should have mentioned at the start, this is being recorded and will be made available uh, on the Campbell YouTube channel. So I will stop sharing just while I make this, um, this presentation available. So I can't see any questions coming in now. No questions yet. So James is typing a question. Um, great to have a question coming up. If anybody else has one, feel free to uh, to type it in. And meanwhile, I will. Try to get this link working.
if I can't get the link working, I'll um, make sure it's emailed around afterwards. But feel free to ask any other questions if anybody has any. Yes, um, Jana Stoyanova, um, the links that you share um, name some great groups, but I wonder if there are specific um, spaces for people to meet. Um, and uh, I can think of the EsmaConf Slack, which is a Slack channel that was a workspace for the EsmaConf conference. I wonder if I can um, share a join link. Um, Yes, I, I think I'll be fine actually. So the Slack space uh, that was used for EsmaConf was used for a number of different purposes for networking and for um, code jams and for discussions. We've got some really interesting projects that came out of discussions from that conference. Um, I'm not really, I don't think there are many open groups um, that allow people to um, collaborate uh, in that way. So that's uh, an interesting observation that having an open group where anybody can join and chat about um, technology is a really important one. Um, I think it's a space that the evidence synthesis hackathon wanted to, to um, fill. And then a, a question um, from Rasmus Klocker. Thank you for a very nice presentation. I was wondering if you have any concrete examples of how we should go about external validation. Uh, for instance, automatic screening of documents. Should we attempt to make a systematic review counterpart to the, um, I guess that's, Imagine that data which had been used extensively to validate um, computer vision tools, ImageNet. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's a really important point that um, it's really important to have uh, not only standardized data that can be used, but also standardized protocols for um, validation. I know it was something that was um, an aim in one of the um, uh, international collaboration for the automation of systematic review meetings that I went to. Um, and um, I, I think having a standardized protocol for how to go about validation, as well as having um, sort of a gold standard reference set. And um, we also need to think about what a gold standard, standard reference set might be if we're testing a computer against a human or testing a computer against the, the perfect answer. I think that's important. Um, there aren't really um, many or any publicly available data sets for systematic reviews, um, which is something I'm uh, working on as part of my fellowship um, to make those available. But those publicly available data sources would then allow people to be using them in validation. But I think um, standardizing protocols for external validation is something that should be done through a, a sort of consensus community based approach. Um, so I think there's a, there's a demand there for that too. Um, and then a question from James, uh, James Thomas. My question is about the usability issue as expectations have changed here over the years. Back in the day, we used to expect to have to learn to use software and went on courses to do that. We still do need to learn how to use R, Stata to do meta-analysis and need to learn to use NVivo, et cetera, for qualitative analysis. Excel is one of the most powerful pieces of software ever made, uh, I think, but it takes a long time to learn to use properly. Why is it that once software is running in the browser, the expectation is that we should just be able to use software instantly without learning how it works? I think that's a really good point. Um, I think one of the problems there, though, is that there's a proliferation of software that mean the, um, uh, the investment in terms of time that you put into learning how to use a tool um, as more and more tools become available um, is increasingly uh, risky. It's much harder to invest time um, when there are lots of different tools and you don't know how well they are supported. Um, that information about support is not very transparent. Um, it's also often the case that tools that start out for free then go premium where you can do certain amounts free, but then the, a lot of the power is held behind a um, costly subscription and then the tool becomes even more expensive. So I can see why people are reluctant to dedicate time to learning how to use a tool. Um, but I, um, one of the, the benefits of using R, I think, is that once you've learned how to use R, using the tools that are produced and can be run as packages um, is much less of an investment. Um, and I think there are always some tools that you can use relatively intuitively. Um, 
I, I think that comes with problems as well as people are used to using search facilities as they might interact with Google, for example, it means that they're less uh, able to use academic search facilities. So there are, there are pluses and minuses with having a very usable user interface. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, it's important to try to understand people's constraints when we're wanting people to um, put an investment into using a new piece of software. Um, if it's very, very easy to produce a lot of tools, um, we can't really expect people to be learning how to use all of them. Um, yeah, no, I think it was a really good question. Um, and then uh, a question from Laurel English, excellent presentation. Um, I have a similar thought question as the first, how do we make this community of practice happen? You mentioned production and isolation. Any ideas on whether it would be a collaborative effort among um, any all or specific systematic review entities globally or nationally? Would it operate through a website or via ESMACOMP, et cetera? So what we wanted with ESMACOMP was to, to have that network um, generate um, through its own effort. And to some extent it, it has, we've had, um, over 1,600 people engage with the conference materials, which is great. I think there are existing communities of practice that made that very successful though. The uh, people who use R are very familiar with um, networks and communities of practice around R. Um, and there are several, and there's some overlapping, uh, some region specific, some um, group specific, like our ladies um, that aim to be very supportive and inclusive. Um, and I think there are real challenges when you try to produce a very inclusive uh, or a very broad community of practice around making sure that that's a safe space where everybody has um, equal voices. Um, so I think there are some real challenges rather than just making a place for people to go um, and thinking about thinking about making sure that people feel safe is very important. Um, but I, I think um, some of the problem stems from the reinvention of systematic review methods across disciplines. So my background is environmental biology. I'm a conservation biologist. And uh, in 2006, uh, methods for systematic review were adopted from Cochrane and, and to some degree Campbell and translated into the field of environment. Um, since I've been involved with systematic reviews um, from 2012, I've seen these reinventions of systematic review methods in lots of different disciplines. And the methodology is translated and um, that translation is generally very minor, uh, particularly now as in systematic review methods in general, we're much more aware of um, and using more diverse methods to deal with more complex issues than just RCTs and quantitative data. Um, but I think those um, reinventions, those, those translations into new disciplines are then often siloed. So there are systematic reviews in computer science, there are um, systematic reviews in, uh, in veterinary science, in dentistry, and in the healthcare topics, whether that's vet dentist or, or healthcare, there are more connections, but I think in a lot of disciplines, they're not very well connected. So having that space between collaborations or between communities of practice that already exist, where there is sharing of methodology, um, it's also, it's important to, to build on those so that people are using systematic review methods consistently uh, and aware of the state of the art, but the same thing goes for, for technology, making sure that everybody is aware of you know the state of the art and what tools are being used to validate. Um, I think one way to do that is to target different disciplines with um, evidence synthesis technology papers. So if you're working in evidence synthesis technology, the chances are what you're doing is discipline um, agnostic. It's applicable across disciplines. Um, so I think there's, there's great benefits to collaborating with people from different disciplines and targeting different journals um, to try to reach those audiences. Um, and then a question from uh, Jorge Llopis. Thanks so much for the insights, Neil. I have two questions. Most likely you heard them before. I'm planning a systematic review on environmental ph phenomenon somehow anecdotally explored so far. So a traditional string search based on title abstract keyword won't find many articles. Then I'm thinking of bulk downloading all papers that might contain info on the phenomenon ret retrieved through a broad search. Is there a, an efficient way to bulk download a long literature list? Um, with institutional access, and then I'm planning to use text mining um, to look for terms. Um, 
Yeah, the, I, I think without going into too much detail, there are lots of tools available. If you go to the systematic review toolbox, there are tools available for um, the second question on, on um, text analysis and text mining. Um, on the bulk loading thing, the bulk downloading thing. Um, so there's a bit of an issue with, um, with systematic reviews because even when you're just doing a systematic review and sharing PDFs amongst your team, you're technically breaking copyright often if they're not the same institution, if we're talking about um, the non-open access papers. So I think um, trying to access things in bulk, trying to build tools that do things in bulk and deal with bulk data when that data is technically copyrighted um, has some challenges. I think there are ways around it. And as we move towards open access, that will be easier. Um, but many of the tools have this constraint. Um, but I think you can hopefully find support on the systematic review toolbox. Um, and then a question from Kira Keenan, um, a more general question than the webinar, but Prisma 2020 have now offered flexibility to allow more computer involvement in reviews. Do you think other guidelines and standards for systematic reviews need to follow suite? One example um, would be, one example here, at least two members of the review team to independently code each study makes it clear that humans should do all the extraction. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, I think to some degree, some of the collaborations uh, and organizations that set standards um, will need to follow very closely developments in um, evidence synthesis technology when it comes to things like machine learning and classification, um, text analysis and automation. Um, I think they're, currently following the cautionary approach, which means they're looking for validation first, and there generally isn't much external validation of these tools, um, meaning that people outside the research team who develop them um, haven't validated them in a meaningful way. Um, I know what you're talking about with Prisma 2020, where there's a computational tools line. Um, yeah, I think there's a need for a bit more validation before those organizations will, um, will allow those tools to be used. Um, I'm also involved in some projects where um, non-systematic review methods are making use of machine learning for vast literatures, um, in particular in relation to climate change. Um, and I think we, we need to see more evidence that that's um, reliable. But I think it also opens a new scope for um, what one of my colleagues referred to as a topography of literature. So um, rather than systematic review and systematic mapping, doing everything manually and looking at human manageable bodies of evidence, topographies might crudely classify very, very large evidence bases. Um, and then it's representativeness that might be more important. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to be done on validating how that looks when comparing uh, the, the vast um, computer uh, synthesized bodies of evidence versus manually um, conducted reviews. Um, and then Katriona Lee, uh, perhaps the last question, uh, some of the ES tech that would make our lives easier depends on journals making their outputs fair, meaning they're findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable. Uh, till we have consistently reliable metadata and usable formats from the journals, we might be constrained in how effectively our ES tech can work. Part of the utopian future, but it's getting better. Yes, there was something in the, um, the link that I put um, to the Cochrane Automation webinar that was talking, I think someone presented on um, making primary research more digitized and computable. Um, and the idea of being able to extract data from primary studies that's already been extracted or provided in a, a usable, extractable and summarizable structured format by the, the authors themselves, perhaps, um, is, is definitely going to make systematic reviews more efficient. Um, I think there are, it's a convergence issue, I think. Um, there's things that can be done by systematic reviewers to try to make the process of manually extracting things quicker. And at the same time, more needs to be done by the uh, underlying research community to make sure that the primary research is more readily synth synthesizable, particularly if it can be made machine readable. And I think there are different communities of practice that are working towards the same goals there. So systematic reviewers uh, might be working more towards better reporting and more structured 
digitized computable reporting of systematic review data. Um, and uh, the open science community is working more towards making sure that as well as being uh, open science compliant, meaning that data is provided in an open format, it's also provided in a meaningful open format that it's structured, it's understandable. Um, and the initial response to, to a lot of the open data movement was that um, data is being provided open, but it's, not, it's still not understandable. So I think there are different communities of practice that are working towards the same goals. But trying to ensure that all primary research is structured and synthesizable is a, obviously an enormous task, given the number of journals and publishers um, and review authors. Uh, but I think there's a need for, for convergence there. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, I think we've run out of time, really. It's now um, just a couple of minutes to go. Uh, I didn't manage to multitask and get my presentation um, in the chat, but we'll make that available probably on the YouTube um, channel. Um, and thanks for your comment, Vivian. Um, yes, and uh, the recording will be available on the um, YouTube channel. Thanks so much for your time and for joining me. I hope that was useful and informative. Um, and I look forward to speaking to many of you in the future. Thank you. Bye.